Uh, and probably the spot where it's like, I should have the notes for how to... So, it tells us like, and there's some header stuff that I <coughs> probably started before coming to class. Shoot, all right. to write some stuff that will match brackets. So, what are we going to call it? What do we want to call our header file? Test.hpp. Test.hpp? No, because this this isn't a header for our test. This is a header for the bulk of the code. Oh, okay, okay. What do we want to call it? Bracket, maybe? <laughs> oh, what were you thinking? I was supposed to say bracket. Bracket. Bracket.hpp. Make sure that you go to your header file and you add that to your list of dependencies. Pragma once. All right, yeah. What's the dot phony in the main file right there? What's the dot phony? The dot phony says that these aren't real files, so don't go bother looking. Don't bother go looking for them. Just rebuild them regardless. This way, if there's a file that happens to be called lint, it'll still actually run the lint command. Or if you have a file named all or clean, those commands actually get run instead of just being like, oh, clean is a file, it's newer than its dependencies, therefore we're good. Okay. So we're going to write a function that's going, or we're gonna write some stuff to check if brackets match, right? Uh, what inputs are we gonna take? Or I guess first, what do we wanna call our function? Read brackets? Yeah. Uh, this function doesn't do the reading. Oh, okay. This function is going to check, is it matched, right? So what are we going to call it? Bracket match, I guess. Is matched. Is matched. Okay. What kind of parameters do we need? Probably need a string. Too. Probably a string. So we'll need to include string. So we'll probably take a string by reference. Okay. And what is it gonna return? Boolean. Boolean. Yep. Uh, pro tip, if you name something is or has, then it's Probably a Boolean. <clears throat> okay. And so we'll go and create a bracket.cpp file. And we're just going to right now return false. So now we're going to go write our tests before we actually implement that. <coughs> it's oh, and we're going to then here we're going to include bracket.hpp. All right, so. What are some things that we probably want to check? Yeah, 
if bracket match returns false? Bracket match returns false when? If the brackets don't match. All right, so boost require um, all right, so not is matched. Give me a string. Curly bracket and then a closed off square bracket. Curly brace, square bracket. Okay. And that we said was false. Booze, or actually, uh, let's actually make this be a check because each of these calls are independent, right? All right, give me another string. Yeah. You can see if it returns true when the string is empty. All right, so is matched for the empty string. That's a good one to check. Give me some more strings. What are some other really simple ones we should check? All the other brackets are true, so. So we should probably have cases for each of the base brackets by themselves. We want to make sure that for each of those they match. And we probably should, let's start with, let's do simple. And we'll have some simple ones then where we boost, check, not is matched, an open parenthesis only for each of the different kinds. And this is where you have to fight with it, uh, wanting to uh, be helpful. And then we're going to need to then do the same thing for each of the closing ones. Okay. So there's the correct ones. There's the incorrect ones. Got an extra in there somehow. All right, that sounds like a good starting pool, right? I think I actually want to move this one off into a separate function. Let's cut. <coughs> so boost auto test case test match. And we'll put in some more complicated ones like that. Okay. So far, so good, right? Um, let's add a simple main.cpp that includes bracket.hpp and main return zero. All right. So far, so good, right? Terminal, new terminal. Make. All right, something done to compile. Did you have to add test CPP to the make file? Um, so oh. to our objects, we need to add bracket dot The test program here is going to be dependent on the compile.o, which will take the test CPP, compile it into a .o file. So that part's taken care of. I did need to add the bracket here so that my program knows I need this. Ta-da, okay, now we're good. So if I run my tests, Ta -ta -ta. Looks like we got a bunch of stuff that failed. 
But it only returns false. So. It only returns false, so that was kind of expected, right? All right. So I guess now we should probably go think about how do we actually want to solve this problem. So, last time for Evil Hangman, we framed out, here's how we want to tackle the problem before we started <coughs> writing any code. So, what's our strategy? How do we want to solve this problem? Yeah. We can start like outlining the cases for each. So um, So start with the big picture first and then go narrower. Yeah. Are yeah. we gonna be taking like, you know, Things that are like that have multiple brackets in them as well. So we're gonna have multiple brackets in the string. So it's probably better to do something like a stack or something. So we will probably want a stack. So make a stack. Then what are we gonna do? Every time a new bracket. Uh, Every time a new bracket, what do you mean by every if time? It, if it reads like a left bracket, it so pushes on the stack. So read through string, right? So that's going to imply some sort of loop, right? All right. So we read through the string, and now if or on. So if we get a left bracket, what do we do? Add to stack. On right brackets, what do we do? If it encounters the the right bracket of the most recent left one, then pop off the stack. Okay, so check for match and remove. If it doesn't match, then and just otherwise, just return false. Well, we check for a match and we remove them. We'll handle the specifics of what does that mean later. Mm -hmm. If it's not an L bracket and it's not an R bracket, what do we do? Continue Otherwise, skip. Okay. And so we've read through the whole string, and at the very end, what do we do? Yeah. Return if this bracket is empty or not. All right, so check if all brackets were matched. Okay. So we're going to make a stack, so we'll include stack. What kind of thing is our stack going to hold? Yeah. Characters. Characters. Sounds good. Um, let's just call it brackets. Check if all of the brackets were matched. What's the condition for that? Yeah. Return is empty. And this stack is empty. Brackets dot empty. Okay. okay. Read through the string. How are we going to do that? Yeah. For each loop. For each loop. Excellent for each character C in string. We don't care about the position in the string so much as as long as they come in order, right? We don't care that this is the fifth character. We just <coughs> care that it's the next character, right? So for each loop sounds appropriate. Okay. Then it looks like we got an if here. So if is <coughs> L brackets.
then we add to the stack. Let's stop push. Else if is our brackets C. Then we do this stuff. All right, check if it's a match and remove. So if not our match, so we said if they don't match, then we fail, right? If not our match brackets dot top and the character, then we return false. And if they do match, then we need to remove them from brackets. Otherwise, we skip, we check if we're empty at the end. Okay, so I guess I need to write a couple functions, don't I? So we have bool is L bracket, which takes a character. We also have is R bracket and R matched. Character L and character R. All right. When is it an L bracket? Now let's just start and say it's never an R bracket. We're gonna just stub all of these out. Why am I doing that? So we have something that's like quote unquote works in our. I, I have something. It sort of works. I can I can compile my code now. And run my test to see if it's any better. It's like well now I fail different cases, don't I? I went from always false to actually when you think about the logic it comes out to always true now. So I basically flipped the cases that I fail now. But my stuff compiles, right? Actually, I think I want to change our match to just always true. All right, so is L bracket, when's it an L bracket? So I can say if C is that character or C is that character or C is that character or C is uh, that character, right? Did I get them all? left chevron, left parenthesis, left curly brace, and left scar bracket. I 
And then for is R bracket, we just have to reverse each of these. Simple match. Memory access violation at the spot, no mapping at fault address. Well, that's not great, is it? <laughs> Why are we getting a seg fault? For each character, if it's an L bracket, we push it onto brackets. If it's, oh. So, we seg faulted. Anyone see where our seg fault is? Yeah. When the stack is empty. When the stack is empty. So if brackets dot empty, or they're not a match, or is short circuiting. So if it's empty, we automatically go inside. Otherwise, it's non-empty, and therefore the top is defined. So our unit test helped us find a bug, right? There we go. Hey, we passed one of our tests. You know, I think I actually want to break this into t multiple cases. Also, this should be a bracket test instead of math test. Test L brackets. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is the these are each going to fail in different ways. So these ones are the simple ones where we've got matching ones. They'll they should all succeed or fail in the same way, right? These ones are the ones where we've all got just an L bracket. So these should all go one way also. And these then this set is all the ones that have just R brackets. And so if they're going to fail, they should fail in the same way. And then here we've got a match case. So we just change some things a little bit. We compile, we rerun. But you know, it also sounds better to say that, hey, we're passing three of our four tests than to say that we're passing one of our two tests, right? Okay. So this one we're failing because we've got mismatched brackets, right? Currently, we're sort of assuming that all left and right brackets match. That's not true, is it? All right, how are we gonna to check to see if these two match? Yeah. So you can use a bunch of if, else, ifs, or switch case in this situation. Oh, I, want, I don't wanna to have to do a big giant if, else, cause we've got what? That's gonna have at least four cases, right? That if you realize that you can just check this for the positive condition and return false otherwise. If you try to check every pairing, you've got 16, right? That's 
awful. The checking for the positive with four cases is just sort of bad, right? Anyone got an easier solution here? Do you guys want me to pull up an ASCII table? That's what I was thinking, actually. If there's like a number you can subtract to see if it matches. So, here's the parenthesis. They're adjacent to each other in the table, right? All right, so we say return r minus l equals one. Make, run the tests. Yep, that's true for parentheses, the square curly and shove runs, it's not. The other ones happen to be two apart. That's a little shorter than having a four-way F, right? Okay. So that's cool, right? So I've got then a bunch of files that look like, let's do this one. So the online judge has sample files where it's like, well, we're going to run some tests. And so we're going to, where they list, here's the number of tests we've got, then each test in the line, and you have to check to see if that line is matched. <coughs> hmm. Do we want to test these also? So I'm gonna make a helper function for testing a file. So the file is going to take, sorry, the function is gonna take the name of the input file and then the name of the file that contains the expected answers. Okay. Do I want to write a function that does it the way that it's supposed to be done in the problem? There's a couple ways we could do this. Let's just do the, we'll go through and I guess we're going to need to include uh, IO stream and F stream, right? Yes? All right, so. Um, I. 
standard is stream fn is input file Then um, fn, we're going to need to read in the int num problems. Right. And then we're going to get lines repeatedly, right? For int i is zero, i less than num problems, i plus plus. So we're going to need to get a line, right? Not a version that takes or that gets a string. Mm -hmm. I never call this function. So you might be like, well, we'll read the line this way. What's the problem that we're going to have? You say this, and then we're going to do a um, equals, so then uh, is matched line. Yes, otherwise, no. And then we say boost require equal answer to expected. Which I guess we have to then also say standard string expected. And we say answers read into expected. Okay, so the idea is we read a line from the problem, we read in the answer, we compute our ex actual answer using is matched. Now the answers are given to us as uh, yes and no, so we convert the boolean true false into yes no. And then we compare to see if what we got and what we expected are the same. And then we can set up three simple problems, boost, auto, test, case, test, morass, where we're going to um, test file, passing in that file, and it's answer file, and then we can set this up for each of the files we want to test. So what's the one little problem that we're going to have going forward?
but we failed some tasks. Maybe we want to go bring these out into separate files or into a separate function. So maybe we want a vector. And so we'll have a vector of bool match many. Um, let's do, um, actually we'll, we'll take in a I string. So, anyone see what the potential problem that we're going to run into is? Read a line and then so what's the problem with all of this? I have three FN and ten num problems. Oh, that's a, that should be an I stream, not an O stream. Oops. So, what's wrong with our solution for this file? Any, do you see a line that you suspect might be the one that you fail? Or that causes you to fail? Yeah. I mean, there's three of them, actually. Yeah? The one's marked in red. One's marked in red? No, actually, that's it saying that, hey, this bracket's not matched. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then it's just white space and line two. So line two is an empty line, right? So what's going to happen when I read? So I read in the number. And then I read in a string, right? And that's going to skip the white space and get the next word, right? That's a problem, right? This is, in fact, probably a problem that you guys had back in Computing 2 when you had to do things the slightly harder way. And you're just like, well, go get me a thing and it skips the white space, right? So we're gonna go back to our test and we're gonna say, well, all right, so standard vector bool answers is, 
match many for f of n. And then we'll have a standard vector. All right, so then I'll say for size t, uh, or actually for each bool actual in answers, we'll read in uh, answers into expected, and then uh, boost require equal. So our solution, our test is going to now, we're going to read all, read through, we're going to match everything. We'll read through each answer. We'll get a corresponding answer from the file. Right. The issue we're going to end up having is, well, we're, We're going to end up skipping that empty line in the front, aren't we? How do you want to handle that? So how are we going to handle empty lines? Does string have a C string value constructor? Yes, we could pass in a C string to string to initialize it. So we just get a line which gets a C string, and then we pass it in to the string constructor to make a new string. Okay, so. So instead of passing it, instead of reading this way, we're going to call fn.getLine. And we're going to pass in a pointer to a C string. Okay. So character data array, how big do we want to make it? Pick a number. Tell me how big you want to make it. Ten, I guess. Ten. So, what's the issue there? So be a little bit too much or too little, so we can't really tell how big the size is. How big is the line? Any of these bigger than 10 characters? Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So 10 might be a little small. Yeah. Couldn't you do line by size? 
line dot size, yeah. our line is empty right now. We haven't read anything. To, if we pick a little bit of a bigger number, 100 doesn't seem excessive, but it's probably bigger than our inputs. Nothing in here is 100 long. Mm -hmm. All right, so this solution's not quite working, is it? Yeah. I think there's a non member function of getLine that takes an extra A in the string and it's in a. Um, Oh, that's what it is. Get line that takes it in, then F in, and pass. I'm like, I'm pretty sure there's a thing like this. Let's actually make a couple changes. So <coughs> yeah, whatever. All right. So let's see, we're still failing. There's some better ways that to have done the test that would have given us better answers, or better things to see. I could read the answers in from both and then uh, check that the vectors are the same. Mm -hmm. All right, so three failures detected. We're failing all of them. So we read a line, get the line from the file, we read in the line, and so does the delimiter come first? It's last. It's last. I'm like, the thingy was right here. Uh, but you know what the problem probably is, I think? We've read the number and then we stopped, and so we're at the end of the first line with the number. Uh, so we need to burn a character. Mm -hmm. 
Hey, past everything except the small one. <laughs> All right, made improvements. Uh, is did the other ones start with a new line test? Looks like I think one of them did. I guess it doesn't. That one doesn't. doesn't, but it does have a new one tested in there. All right. I'm kind of curious if the issue is <coughs> that. No. All right. All right, so questions on what we've done? I got a couple issues to work out, but you guys brain fried need a little bit of a break. Yeah? All right, let's go take a break and we'll talk about operators and complex numbers afterwards. Now I'm curious, all right, what could be wrong with this? Do you have the C C plus plus themes extension? I think I just have the C C plus plus extension, not the speakers. Okay. Or the the C C plus plus one here, yeah. But I don't know, it's just like confusing sometimes because I had that on my on my VS Code before, but do I need to bring it down or reinstall it because I'm using like the Uh 
yeah, you probably need, you might need to re gut it. It's pe it's picky on where it has to be. Um, or, 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 I, it's very picky on that. It has to be in a folder. Or it has to be a zip. It has to contain a folder called PS1A, and then in there it has to have everything. Um, but come talk to me later, and I can try to help you debug what's going on. Okay. Um, I have a Mac, but I have a desktop at home, so mm -hmm. I can't really like show you my questions. I can only ask them. So, yeah. Unless that, what was going to come to um, the office hours yesterday that was, that was busy doing some more stuff mm -hmm. comes in another office. Okay. Okay. any obviously missing open spots. All right, we're gonna work on some complex numbers. So you guys learned about complex numbers in math, right? Those are the ones that have real parts and imaginary parts, and so you see them written, it's like, Z is usually the imaginary number for some whatever reason. So you see this written as X plus Y, I, where X and Y are real numbers, and I is the imaginary unit, is the square root of negative one. Uh, and you guys probably just did them all in Cartesian form like this, right? Uh, how many of you have seen them in polar form where you've got an angle and a magnitude? One of you a little bit. So we'll make some stuff for making it nice and easy to switch between uh, Cartesian and polar forms. Oh. We'll also create some operators, which is the big thing here. So, <laughs> so pragma once class complex. All right, so what do we need to represent our complex number? Yeah? A real part and an imaginary part. A real part and an imaginary part. So double real and imaginary. And we're going to need a constructor, right? What's it going to take? What parameters do we want in our constructor? Double real, double imaginary. Double real, double imaginary. I'm going to give them default values of zero. And then we'll initialize our real and imaginary parts. Okay, that was easy, right? And a 
Okay, so then we'll go and add our fields. So we'll have our real field, which returns that. Okay. All right, so what are, let's take a complex number. What do you want for a complex number? What's your favorite complex number? Two plus three i. All right. Booze check equal z, and well, the number should equal itself. That's a good thing to check, right? Or let's actually do check it against the thing that should be. Um, Z plus two should be four, three, right? And Z plus I should be two, four, right? So. I guess I need to, and this will be complex i. But we need to add a static complex i is the number 0, 1. Not how you define class variables. Takes a comp. Like, huh, I haven't made class constants in C++ in so long. All right, so issue, we haven't made our addition operator yet, have we? So if we try to make this code, it's not gonna compile. And also I need to adjust my make file. This is gonna be called complex. Oh, we've got actually a more pressing issue. Ah, <sighs> already. 
So if you're following along, we just got this big, huge honkin compile error, right? And so if you see a big, huge, long honkin compile error, what does that probably mean? Probably some stuff we didn't think about. No. Uh, what did you learn in computing three when you got a big, huge, long compute, uh, compile error? Yeah. Nope, it's not that actually. So this is a template error, which you're like, where do we have a template error, right? It's like, I'm not using a template, right? Uh, so here we've got this macro, right? That checks if the two things are the same, and if it's not, it prints. The comp it's going to end up printing, here's what they are, right? Issue is they don't have an O stream operator. So the, the unit test is trying to print it to a stream, but it doesn't have an O stream operator. So I'm gonna have to talk about O stream operators earlier today than I was planning on doing so. So, Oh, and I also need a semicolon. <laughs> um. All right, so we need an O stream operator. So we're going to pound include I O stream. So, what's the signature for our O stream operator look like? Did you guys do O stream operators in computing three? Yeah, you had to write your own. All right, what's the signature look like? So it's gonna be an operator. What's the operator that we use for O streams? What's, which is the insertion operator? So, operator left shift. It's the left shift operator is what gets overridden as the O stream operator. All right, what's the first parameter? Yeah. Are we referencing an O stream object? Yep, an O stream reference. And the second operator is going to be const complex reference C. And the return type? O stream up. Standard O stream reference. Copy. when you're standing up and in front of a bunch of people. Okay. So we're gonna need to print out our, uh, oh, last thing we're gonna do here is going to be to output the return out so we can chain these. All right, so if z dot imaginary is zero, then we'll output z's real part. Else if z's real part is zero, we'll output z's imaginary part and an i. Else if z's imaginary part is greater than zero, we output put z's real part plus we'll put some nice proper spacing z's imaginary part and an i and otherwise this is actually a ne a negative number 
and we'll actually do some trickery to make it print out correctly. Const complex is not derived from const boost function. Return left equals right. <coughs> this should have uh, an equality operator. Why is reference wrapper? I've done all this stuff without the tests before. I haven't done it with tests. And now we get live fire demonstrations in front of class. Isn't that great? I guess we'll just go and deal with the mains and I have stuff to figure out for after class. And we'll probably end up doing some unit tests for this tomorrow, even though it's not in the right order. Okay. So grabbing the main. So Probably should include complex study. All right. So I guess now we can see out Z, right? Does that look right? 2 plus 3i? Alright. But what if I want to add two complex numbers together? Actually, let's do a z1 and a z2. What's your next favorite complex number? Three plus four i. And at this point, it's like, oops, missing a semicolon. Don't you love semicolons? All right, so issue, we don't have a plus operator for complex numbers yet. We're gonna need to make one. 
So, do we want to make our plus operator be a member or a non-member function? Somebody, all right, who wants it to be a member function? Nobody. Who wants it to be a non-member function? Lots of you. And who's the one person who's abstaining? Uh, I need to bring my little rubber eraser so I have something I can actually throw at people. Okay, so I want to justify the why should it be a non-member function. Because it's an operation that you want to carry across other like, files. It's an operation you're going to carry across different things. Yeah. You can. It's going to return the right kind of thing anyway, so we could chain them anyway. Yeah. So that the last time the operate operation doesn't always have to be a complex number. It can be something else. Don't always have to be a complex number. Well, we're going to create an operator plus spelling whoosh. And our operator plus is going to take a complex number z1 and a complex number z2. Or do we want left hand side, right hand side? Let's do left hand side, right hand side. So it takes a complex number, right? Now we've got an implicit cast because we have a one argument constructor. Um, also, note that this will end up returning a complex number. You're like, where do we have a one argument constructor? This is a one argument constructor. We have it, but you're like, what? It's got two arguments, right? Except that note that they're both defaults. So I can supply zero, one, or two arguments. So therefore, there's a one argument constructor, which means there's an implicit cast from doubles to complex numbers. So this is the form that our, comp that our operator takes. And so we'll return a complex number that has left-hand sides real plus right-hand side's real, and then the left-hand side's imaginary plus the right-hand side's imaginary. So that was pretty easy, right? We run it, and so... 2 plus 3i plus 3 plus 4i is 5 plus 7i, right? All right, what if we want to subtract? Oh, darn, looks like we're going to have to implement that function too. Well, fortunately, we done most of the work, right? We duplicate this, turn it into a subtraction operator. We'll duplicate this function, turn that into a subtraction operator, and do these operations, or do a subtraction instead. Me. So if we subtract them, we get negative 1 minus 1i. One Is that right? OK. Hmm. 
<sighs> so it doesn't like having the unary plus operator here. And if I try to be like, well, what about plus minus V2? Doesn't like that either. So it doesn't understand the unary operator. So we're gonna, but we probably should have one, right? It would kind of make sense that they want to be able to represent the negative version of the number separate from the subtraction operation, right? It'd be kind of annoying to have to say zero minus z, right? So we're going to add in the unary operators. Are the unary operators members or non-members? Members. So the rule of thumb is your unary operators are members. Your binary operators, if they treat both sides the same, are non-members. So, complex operator plus const Does that look right now? And then I could go back and have my minus plus if I wanted, and that should give the same answer. All right. I'm going to add one more here. So what's the tilde operator for? Is that for like the opposite? Or like the, it's like flipping all the bits. I Flips think. all the bits. So that is bitwise negation, right? So it's a different kind of negation. So for complex numbers, I'm gonna slightly abuse it to refer to complex conjugate, which is also a kind of negation. You keep the same real part, but you invert the imaginary. Uh, in re regular math, when you wanted the complex conjugate, you would put an over bar. We can't put over bars on our variables, so we're going to do a uh, tilde instead. I think for a mathematician, it'll take them about 30 seconds to figure out what's going on. So z1 minus the complex conjugate complex conjugate of z2. Is negative one plus seven i. Okay. Questions? Okay. Oh, darn it, we can't do the increment operator. So, just because you made the plus or the add operator doesn't mean you get the unary plus and it doesn't mean you get the increment. You have to supply those yourself. So, is the increment operator going to be a member or non member? Member. Assignment operators have to be members.
remember that this operator is going to return a reference to the number itself. Alright, so our real is going to increment by the right hand side's real, and our imaginary will increment by the right hand side's imaginary, and then we return, what do we return? This, this is a pointer. Dereference De this. Okay, that looks better. And of course, we have to do the same thing for our decrement operator, don't we? Uh, annoyances, right? So this did work. What's going on here? Is there a question? So what's happening here? Now the right hand side's a double, right? Or is actually an int, right? Why is this work? Right. So remember when I said that there's a default or that there's an implicit cast constructor? So what's happening here is that it says, all right, well, two can be passed in as the parameter for a one argument constructor to create a complex number. And then I have an addition operator between two complex numbers. And so that works. And it does work the other way too. Questions, comments, concerns? Do you feel like you have a better handle on operators now? What else did we say we'd put in? 
All right, we got plus minus, oh, we should do multiplication and division and, um, so a, the equality operator you get for free. We did the complex conjugate and we can also do an ice cream operator. Ice cream operators are, uh. <coughs> So the reading data and writing data, which is easy and which one is hard? Writing is easy and reading is hard. If there is some specification, when you output, you only have to make sure that you match the parts of the specification that you use. When you're reading, you have to be able to handle the entire thing, right? So here, our Ostrom operator, I haven't actually covered all the bases for getting it into its minimal form. Uh, there is a number of little edge cases where it's like, well, if uh, the imaginary part is one, you don't write one I, right? So if I want to add in a multiplication operator, this actually becomes annoying. Uh, Oh, no, it's not working because I haven't actually defined it yet. <clears throat> that's a now does that work over here? No. And star equals has to be a member. <laughs> Reduced to a problem already solved, right? So we're going to solve the other case. In reality, I wouldn't do it that way for production work because it's doing extra work. So when we do the multiplication of two complex numbers, how do you calculate the real part? So like the real part of the number is just left hand side's real part. You multiply by the left hand side real part. You multiply by the right hand side's real part. And um. you're like you're making me go back to like high school freshman. Uh, Algebra or whatever, geometry, minus the left-hand side's imaginary part times the right-hand side's imaginary part. So remember, the, uh, i times i is negative 1. So the result of multiplying the imaginary parts together is a real number but it's negative. Then for the imaginary parts, that's gonna come from taking a real number and an imaginary number and multiplying them together. 
So here we have the left-hand side's real part times the right-hand side's imaginary, plus the left-hand side's imaginary part times the right-hand side's real part. Fun and games, right? So, what's Z1 times the complex conjugate of Z1? Uh, looks like negative 5, about 13. I oh, know, yeah, never mind, that's right. So, uh, 2 times 2 is 4, right? We have 2 plus 3i and 2 minus 3i. So then 3 times negative 3 is negative 9 times negative 1 from i squared is plus 9. So 4 plus 9 is 13. Then on the other side of things, we have 2 times 3 and 2 times negative 3. Those two cancel out. So we're left with a real number. Fun, right? Anyone want to do the division operator? You're like, not really. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns? All right. Have a good day. I will see you guys tomorrow. And I'll see if I can figure out what's wrong with the unit tests.